let's go to the next question 30 year old with a family history of hearing loss which is bilateral slowly progressive tinnitus is there conductive hearing loss with the typical apparent hearing loss at 2000 hertz what is that notch called as Karhach notch is something uh, which should not be basically forgotten. If you carry on uh, an audiogram typically, there is a 40 decibel uh, airborne gap and about 2000 hertz loss called the Karhach notch is something which should not be forgotten in relation to the otosclerosis is what need to be remembered. So do you think this is a stock question? Very much a stock question. Okay. So let's go to the next question. This is a challenging question. I will take two minutes of your time. The patient has got a grade 4, 5 visico reflux. What is the management of choice? So once more, visico reflux is a routine topic in the exam. But first of all, what is this grading? Let us be sure about. And what is the management protocol? Surgery or no surgery? Antibiotics plus surgery or only antibiotics? This is what examiner want to test you. How well you have done your urology posting. Basically, the classification of this grading of visicoeutric reflex is into grade 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5 doctor. So what do you mean by visicoeutric reflex basically? The renal pelvis and calyces are basically examined from the bladder. The urine instead of passing down into the urethra and out is passing up through the ureter all the way into the kidneys. That's what is happening in the visicoeutric reflex. Now you are very sure it is a simple English. Grade 1 means the urine is back up to the ureter only and the renal pelvis is not affected. It is healthy and the calyces are sharp. It is called grade 1. The, ure the urine now has gone all the way to ureter, the renal pelvis and calyces. But still the renal pelvis is very sharp. You have done a retrograde urogram and you are seeing calyces very sharp. Then grade 3. It has gone all the way into the ureter and collecting system and the ureter and pelvis are mildly dilated and blunted. Calyces are blunted. Then it is called grade 3 and moderately blunted is grade 4 and grade 5 is severely blunted and finally ureter become tortuous. So that is how you will be grading the visico ureteric reflux. Now the question is, why are we bothered in a pediatric patient when he is having visico ureteric reflux? This refluxing urine continuously can become infected and that can lead to renal scarring which can lead to development of the end stage renal disease by the time he is a angry young man of about 20 years. He is being detected with hypertension with a reduced kidney size and uh, he is found to have end stage renal disease. Retrospectively when you look at uh, he was having recurrent UTI for which uh, he was tossed from one pediatrician to the other pediatrician. Mother also complains that this child was having bedwetting as a problem doctor. So all these were not given a proper care and diagnosis was not uh, initiated. That was the main uh, problem. So visico reflex, you have to be doubly sure. It can be potential cause for the leading uh, to the end stage renal disease uh, with a scarred kidney is what need to be remembered. Now this reflux nephropathy is typically the reflex of the sterile or infected urine from the bladder to one of the kidneys via the ureter leading to the renal scarring. And there is a Infection which is required. Once more the question is, you can have a sterile urine going back or you can have a sterile urine which has gone back and got infected. Will the scars develop only if infection is there or even a sterile urine also is capable of causing the scarring of the kidney or not is what the examiner is asking you. Unless the infection is there, it will not lead to the development of the scarring. And E. coli is the most common pathogen leading to the development of the scarring of the kidneys in the reflex uh, uropathy is what need to be remembered. Always higher the grade of the reflex, greater is the likelihood of the progressive scarring associated with the infection. Unless the infection is not there, there is no scarring. So one of the important uh, uh, choices given to you is postnatal scarring can occur even in the absence of UTI is a wrong statement. Now you are all very confident uh, that it is not the answer. Now let us go further in our discussion about it. Intravenous urography if you take in a given suspected case of recurrent UTI of a child where you are suspecting uh, reflux uropathy, what do you expect on the intravenous urography? There is a deformity of the calyces and there is a loss of the parenchymal thickness. Once more, which part of the kidney 
one of the other options given to you. Is it the mid zone of the kidney or is it the upper and the lower poles which are the most commonly checked out areas for the thinning of that uh, parenchyma when you are interpreting an intravenous uh, urography uh, radiograph. Commonly it is polar, not the mid zonal is the place where the scarring is looked for whenever you have done an intravenous urography in a given case of reflux nephropathy. There is a reason doctor, your other option that uh, the renal scarring begins in the middle, mid polar region is a wrong statement so you don't want to consider it. Now you have only two choices. Choice number one is, if you give antibiotics versus that of the surgery, it is equally good, the long term outlook. Is it a true statement? Or do you want to give amoxicillin as an antibiotic for prophylaxis, which is the one you want to do? Fundamentally, doctor, there is a role for the prophylaxis, antibiotic prophylaxis, only if it is in the grade 1, 2 or 3, but not in grade 4 and 5 is what uh, the well-read uh, urology seniors have already done the discovery. So there's a reason doctor, you must be sure about the protocol of management of uh, the reflux uropathy. Conservative management of the reflux of the grade 4 is considered to be less successful than the surgery. The role of the conservative non-surgical treatment is only there up to the stage 3 is what you need to basically understand. For the grades 4 and 5, the surgery should be the treatment of choice, but before that you must be doubly sure. Sometimes detrusor instability also can lead to the development of this kind of reflux that you have to rule out and then go ahead with the surgery as a mode of therapy in the grade 4 and 5 is what I want to underscore to all of you. So if it is about 6 to 10 years old child and he has got a bilateral grade 3 and 4 reflux or a grade 5 reflux at about age 6 to 10 he should undergo the surgical repair as the initial treatment is what I want to underscore to all of you. So there's a reason doctor, the very premises that uh, the surgery and antibiotics can be equally good in the case of uh, grade 4, 5 and 6 is not acceptable statement is what I want to once more underscore to all of you. Now, the choice C is also less likely. Then last comes the antibiotic prophylaxis. Probably examiner wants to know, if at all you give antibiotics, which is the prophylactic agent of choice? Let us consider that is what examiner means. If that is so, then once more there is a protocol for type of antibiotic you want to choose in management of a reflux uropathy. Penicillins, amoxicillin and the first generation cephalosporins are the drugs of the choice because of their wonderful activity against the gram negative rots and also a oral bioavailability being good. If it is an infant, the choice of antibiotic is amoxicillin or first generation cephalosporin. If the patient is between 3 to 6 years, it is the sulfamethoxazole and nitrofurantoin. And if it is the older children and the young adults, it is the trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Now accordingly, you need to basically decide. Uh, the child is about 3 years in the history given to you. There's a reason oral amoxicillin still holds good as a wonderful agent against, uh, as an antibiotic prophylaxis is what I want to underscore to all of you. Now, typically this is a given case of a child who has got a visico ureteric reflux. All of you know this is the urethra, this is the bladder and here you are having the ureter which is inserting into the bladder. When you pass it the contrast, you don't expect the contrast in the bladder to pass into the ureter. But here it is passing into this right ureter what is the diagnostic finding of excellence in the case of uh, the reflex uropathy is what I want to underscore to all of you. But still it is a case of mild reflex is what I want to underscore. But if there is any dilatation of the ureter, dilatation of the pelvis, then it is basically called the grade 3 up to grade 6 of the reflex uropathy. Now you are very sure about uh, what is the classification what is the management protocol, which is the antibiotic of choice and protocol. So only thing when you walk into the surgery ward tomorrow, you must be doubly sure about this pediatric uh, surgery. Let's go to the next question. A three-year-old child with a fever, dysuria, gross hematuria with a prominent suprapubic area which is dull on percussion, but the RBCs are not there and there is no proteinuria, then what is the most likely diagnosis in this given case? There are no RBCs in the urine. So there is a reason doctor, 
Are there no RBCs? There are RBCs. Okay. So what is the possibility that you are expecting in this given case? It can be glomerulonephritis can cause hematuria, UTI can cause hematuria, and posturitral valves can predispose to the UTI, which can cause the development of hematuria. So it is not going to come to your rescue to help you out. But what is going to come to rescue is this important finding. There is a prominent suprapubic area which is dull on percussion. So what is the common cause for a suprapubic area mass lesion which can be dull on percussion? It can be a mass lesion, it can be pregnancy, it can be ascites, it can be a bladder. So all these uh, fetus, flatus and uh, uh, feces and fluid, all of you know very well. So now the question here is, what are the two con what are the two possibilities in this given case at least? He can't be a three year old pregnant. So there's a reason doctor, bladder, a distended bladder is one of the important possibility. So only two things, it can be teratoma or it can be a partial urethral valve. But the typical fever, dysuria, gross hematuria which are all suggestive of uh, an acute infectious stage in such a small child of about three years old you should not forget to consider the posterior urethral valves as the possibility, a simple question that has been paraded before you. Now let us have one two comments about what are these posterior urethral valves. Typically the caudal end of the mesonephric duct during the embryogenesis will be absorbed into the primitive cloaca and finally you will be having the remnants of this posterior urethral folds called the plicae colliculi are the ones which are there and about 95% of uh, urethral valves will be originating uh, basically from this uh, remnants which have not remained remnant uh, and did not become atritic uh, is what you need to basically understand. Now how does a child who has got a urethral valve will be presenting? In infancy you can catch him, as a toddler you can catch him, as an adult you can catch him in adolescent. It depends upon the type of clinical presentation. The diurnal enuresis, morning and night the child is uh, wetting without his own control. In the boys who are older than 5 years, similarly a secondary diurnal enuresis. As a small child he was alright but later on by the time he is 7 or 8 years old in the night he is having the bed wetting. Similarly while voiding he is having pain and uh, he has got a decreased force of the stream. Or if there is a UTI, they are all indicative of the posterior urethral valves. You need to have a high index of clinical suspicion. Similarly, because of that abdominal distension due to the bladder in the suprapubic area, like an abdominal mass, as what is uh, given to you as a case, or with a florid renal failure, if you have not diagnosed it early, any of them can be the clinical presentation is what I want to underscore to all of you. Now what you can see in the given case of uh, the posterior urethral valve is... Uh, the trabeculated bladder and the high grade visico ureteric reflex with the kinking and uh, dilatation of the ureter is what you are able to see here. So one of the common causes for the visico ureteric reflux is the posterior urethral valves is what I want to underscore to all of you. Now are any children susceptible to develop uh, posterior urethral valves which you can diagnose antenatally itself very much? If there is any oligohydramnios History is one of the important risk factors for development of it. Similarly, bilateral hydronephrosis or if there is an incomplete uh, emptying of a thick walled bladder, they are all the important indications uh, for the presence of the posterior urethral valve is what I want to underscore to all of you. Similarly, Potter species, presence of ascites, a palpable abdominal mass because of the bladder involvement and uh, pulmonary hyperplasia in a newborn they all must give you a clue for a possibility of uh, the posture urethral valve's presence is what you need to basically understand. And within the first 24 hours of the life after the birth, if there is any history of uh, inability to pass the urine by a given newborn child, you should think of the possibility of the posture urethral valve is what I want to underscore to all of you. And if you have not recognized the posture urethral valve very early, the affected boys later on can become develop urosepsis, dehydration, failure to thrive, all this becomes uh, the major problem. Similarly, if you take the toddlers, the problem in voiding and the recurrent UTI must also make you to think of the possibility of the posterior urethral valves. Today, your encyclopedic doctor, just to open up Bailey in Love, read Bailey daily is the rule. Let's go to the next question.
toxic synovitis of the hip, what are the important features? It is not tuberculosis of the hip. It is not the Perthes disease of the hip. It is a simple upper respiratory tract infection or any systemic infection. Following that, there is a development of a hip pain in a child. Must make you to think of this very important entity called transient synovitis of the hip. Now let us talk about this important condition. In fact, if I ask you a question, between 3 to 10 years of age, if, what is the most common cause for the acute hip pain? The most common cause is the transient synovitis is what you need to basically understand. And the hip, if you are doing the physical examination, you need to check for the external rotation, flexion and the abduction. And there is a restriction of the motion of the hip joint in two important uh, movements. Where do you find the restricted motion? In the abduction of the hip joint and the internal rotation, there are the two important postures where there is a restriction of the movement in the case of the transient synovitis of the hip is what need to be remembered. Of course, one third may not have uh, any limitation at all. And the hip becomes very painful even if you are trying to do a passive movement and the hip uh, is very tender to the palpation. And one of the very important sensitive tests for the transient synovitis is called as the log roll test. Now let us talk about it. What is log roll test? Patient will be lying supine. Examiner will be gently rolling the involved limb from side to side. And this will cause an involuntary muscle guarding on one side compared to that of the other. Because of the presence of the synovitis uh, is what you typically clinically examine called a log roll test is the test of choice in the case of the transient synovitis. Now, which are the joints which can become involved? Hip can be involved, knee also can be involved. But one important thing you should not forget is, if there is a significant amount of effusion or if there is any deformity of the joint, you should never consider the transient synovitis. It is that problem which you are seeing evidently, tuberculosis of the knee joint can lead to tubercular synovitis with the development of the effusion, with the development of deformity. There you should not talk about synovitis, doctor. There you have to talk about TB only. But if there is no effusion, no joint abnormality, re recent respiratory tract infection, then the child has developed the presence of a hip pain or a knee involvement with a limited uh, internal rotation and abduction, then you should think of the possibility of the transient synovitis. Often there is a history of trauma. Viral antibody titers also are positive. After you have given vaccination, post-vaccinially patient can develop hip pain because of the transient synovitis and there is a theory of allergic predisposition is what I want to underscore. Now, how can you know that it is not infective and it is only allergic in its very diathesis? You do the complete blood picture. If this synovitis is because of uh, infection, marked amount of leukocytosis will be there. ESR will be elevated. But ESR being normal, CBP being normal in a small child of about 4 years old, developing this kind of transient hip pain, you should suspect of uh, the transient synovitis is what I want to once more underscore to all of you. If you do the ultrasound, how is it going to help you? It can show the presence of an intercapsular effusion and it can enable you to know about what are the other possible diagnoses is what I want to underscore to all of you. And similarly, if you do the ultrasound, you can differentiate another important cause called uh, Perthes disease from that of the transient synovitis, where the synovial membrane thickening is one important finding an ultrasound which will enable you to distinguish between the Perthes disease and that of the transient synovitis. So there's a reason, doctor. Finally, what is your answer? Ultrasound will show the presence of the widening of the joint space and ESR will be normal and uh, it can follow the upper respiratory tract infection and it is not the adduction, it is the abduction limitation is the one which uh, typically you will be seeing. Uh, so what is the final, it is abduction and internal rotation, they are the two restricted movements is what I want to underscore. So he can't hold it in internal rotation, internal rotation is limited. So that is the reason it has become the exclusion here is what uh, you need to basically understand. Let's go to the next question. Enzyme replacement therapy is currently available for which important disease? I'll give you a parallel question. Gene therapy is effective currently only in one disease. What is that disease, doctor? Where gene therapy helped us to uh, 
totally change the clinical course of one single disease. Yes? So I'll give you as a small quiz for you. Gene therapy is no more a fiction novel. It is a real story is what need to be remembered. Now, enzyme replacement, where do you, where is it going to help? Gotches. There's a recombinant enzyme called imiglucerase is the one which is being used over here. The macrophage targeted acid beta glucosidase is the one which you are administering here. And it's very highly effective, especially in the Gotch's disease, where there is a splenomegaly, hematological manifestations, skeletal disease. In this condition, this important enzyme can help you is what need to be remembered. So anemia, thrombocytopenia, visceromegaly, everything will start to slowly reverse once you give 9 to 18 months of therapy with uh, this very important enzyme replacement, uh, which is a recombinant imiglucerase, is the enzyme which is being given, uh, is what I want to underscore. But uh, one of the manifestations of Gautier's is still not responsive to this uh, enzyme replacement. What is that, doctor? Skeletal manifestations are not responsive, is what you need to basically remember. Let's go to the next question. Cardiomyopathy is typically seen in which important group of uh, conditions, but not in which? So one of the favorite questions once more. Causes for the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and restrictive cardiomyopathy, dilated cardiomyopathy, you have to be doubly sure about. So please remember, doctor, alcoholism. Commonly you find throughout life, after working uh, as a driver, and he had been um, habituated to booze whenever he is off the duty, landing with you with a florid edema with a dilated cardiomyopathy. So alcoholism should not be forgotten. Doxorubicin therapy among the antineoplastic drugs and HIV can also lead to the development of cardiomyopathy. Coronary vasculitis is one of the important problems in HIV disease doctor. There's a reason I still can't forget a 26 year old individual with the HIV positivity with nearly a score of about more than 100 wickets in his uh, sexual exposure history, repenting about his uh, pedal edema with a severe amount of vasculitis uh, of the coronaries. Uh, finally, the patient succumbed by about sixth day in the intra-hospital stay. So please remember, the involvement of the heart as a future cardiologist, you should not forget the HIV. Similarly, Chagas disease can cause dilated cardiomyopathy, anemia, thyrotox causes pregnancy, glycogen storage diseases, hypophosphatemia, amyloidosis, and very important are the neuromuscular disorders can lead to the development of uh, the dilated cardiomyopathy is what I want to underscore to all of you. So Dukin's muscular dystrophy, the Frederick's ataxia, they are the two important conditions which lead to cardiomyopathy. So I still remember the history of uh, four sisters the eldest sister developing ataxia at the age of about 8 years. Slowly by the time she was 14, she was feeling fatigue. By about 16, she succumbed to the cardiomyopathy or the Frederick's ataxia. The second sister has developed a very early onset of the cardiomyopathy which has succumbed her without much of uh, florid neurological and skeletal manifestations of Frederick's ataxia. Finally, the third younger sister has developed by about third year a wide uh, stabbing guide she was having, uh, a wide stepping guide she was having. Uh, so once more a cerebellar involvement starting in her. So a family of Frederick's ataxia with the cardiomyopathy being the final death sentence in the case of the Frederick's ataxia as a neuro uh, cardiologist you should not uh, basically forget. Now alkaptinuria does not cause is what need to be remembered. Now what are the causes for the restrictive cardiomyopathy? Hemochromatosis, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, carcinoid, glycogen storage diseases and anthracycline toxicity, they all can lead to the restrictive cardiomyopathy. That's the reason glycogen storage disease causes other type of cardiomyopathy that is uh, the restrictive type. How about the alkaptinuria? In alkaptinuria, you can see the calcification of the cartilages of the ear, joint mobility diminishing leading to osteoarthritis like picture with ankylosis, joint effusions. And you can involve, it can also involve the heart with the development of aortic and mitral valvulitis as a presentation, but not the cardiomyopathy. It is the endocardial compartment. That is, uh, the valvulitis is the presentation of the alkaptinuria. That is the reason it becomes the answer. Let's go to the next question. It's a very interesting question. Beta thalassemia major. What are the important features that you see? 
all of you know hereditary spherocytosis increases the osmotic fragility of the rbc and uh, the beta thalassemia decreases the osmotic fragility all of you know very well so basically what is this osmotic fragility fundamentally you will be incubating the rbcs in varying concentrations of the hypotonic solution of the sodium chloride and as the sodium chloride concentration is decreasing what do you mean by decreasing sodium chloride concentration more water less salt is called decreasing concentration all that more water of the hypotonic solution will run into the cells and it will cause the swells to undergo the swelling if you take a normal rbc it will start to swell and break at a concentration of the nacl of about 0.5% is what i want to underscore to all of you whereas if it is a hereditary spherocytosis they cannot expand even little water enters then only they start breaking so there's a reason even at about 0.4 to 0.5% itself they start to break at even higher nacl concentrations is what i want to underscore to all of you so you can remember doctor increased fragility and decreased fragility if it is a spherocyte it is a increased fragility if it is a target cell it is a decreased fragility is what need to be remembered so hereditary spherocytosis hemolytic disease immune hemolytic anemias zeev's syndrome otherwise cirrhosis hyperlipidemia jaundice combination is called zeev's syndrome they all lead to the development of an increased fragility whereas thalassemia major sideroblastic anemia liver disease where you find target cell there is a decreased fragility for the osmotic fragility test is what you need to fundamentally understand 